This video will take another look at the 1875 Northern Pacific Railroad Bridge collapse at Brainerd, Minnesota. If you haven't watched my first video on this subject, please check it out too. It is one of my most popular videos. As the Northern Pacific Railroad pushed west through Minnesota, the crossing of the Mississippi River at Brainerd was its first major obstacle. As such, construction on the bridge began in 1870. The fancy wooden Howe Truss Bridge was completed on March 8, 1871. Howe Truss bridges were pretty much the standard in 1871. This image shows how these bridges appeared from the front, from the side, the bottom, and the top. The 1871 bridge had three main truss sections, each 140 feet long. Two of these truss sections were built under the track, while one was built primarily over the track. This design was to allow steamboats to pass underneath the bridge. Taking a closer look at one of the truss segments from the 1871 bridge shows the patented Howe design. There were seven thick vertical structural beams on each half of the truss that leaned in toward the center. This was the Howe design. The 1871 Brainerd Bridge had five sections, but only the center three were the primary ones. In the early bridge photos, these sections actually looked like a series of X shapes. Looking a little closer, each X was actually composed of two center-leaning posts, bisected by one post leaning the other way, which formed the X shape. The schematic shows this a little better. The two center-leaning posts are shown in red, and the single post leaning the opposite way is shown in blue. This again shows how a Howe truss bridge was constructed. The 1871 bridge collapsed on July 27, 1875, as a train was crossing from east to west. Obviously, this was a challenging event for the Northern Pacific Railroad. This photo is from the east side of the river, looking southwest. This photo was from the west side of the river, looking northeast. This was also where I made a big error in my first video. I put together a model of the 1871 bridge, then estimated what the temporary fix may have looked like. I have learned since not to estimate anything. Check and double check if you can. So what did the temporary fix actually look like? First of all, the Northern Pacific needed to get the line back up as fast as possible to keep goods and services flowing east and west. General Manager Charles W. Meade departed St. Paul for Brainerd immediately to lead the important decisions that needed to be made. This 1875 Halstead map shows the Mississippi River crossing in Brainerd. When General Manager Meade arrived, one of the first decisions made was to build a temporary pile bridge just north of the fallen one. Pile pattern bridges were said to be stronger than ordinary truss bridges. In this sample segment, there are five piles that are driven into the ground to support the overhead bridge structure. Steam pile drivers were employed to drive these pilings into the ground, like this one, mounted to a railroad car. A barge was also built for a steam pile driver, so the work could proceed on the river. Carpenters arrived on scene, and work continued around the clock. The temporary pile bridge was completed on August 11, 1875, 15 days after the first bridge had collapsed. The temporary bridge was put in constant use to catch up with the accumulated freight. The pile bridge, which cost about $6,000 to complete, may have looked something like this. 
I am unsure if there are any surviving images of the temporary bridge. A little over a week after its completion, disaster nearly struck again at the New Brainerd Bridge site. On August 21, 1875, as a train was crossing the bridge, the brake beam of one of the rail cars dropped, catching a tie. Before the train could be stopped, the car was thrown from the track and ties were torn out for 10 to 12 feet. The bridge withstood the shock, so a repeat of the first bridge collapse was averted. The Northern Pacific found that the train contained cars from two different railroads, which did not share the same kind of brake fastenings. This caused a brake beam from one of the cars to drop and rip out the section of ties. Ironically, this was what the company had suspected as the cause of the first bridge collapse. A few weeks later, the railroad completed a salvage operation on the locomotive that had fallen into the river during the bridge collapse. The locomotive had sat along the western bank of the Mississippi River since July 27th, about a month and a half. The bank on the west side of the river had been graded and a track was laid down to the rusty and battered monster. A couple of powerful locomotives on top of the hill slowly and sadly drew her up to a proper level again. She was a sad looking sight as she was slowly drawn across the temporary railroad bridge. The damaged engine was pulled through Brainerd where everyone stopped and gazed at her remains, not speaking a word. Only the boiler, the heavy frame, and the skeleton of the cab remained, and they were covered with mud and rust. The sight of the wrecked locomotive, as she slowly proceeded through town, brought back the memory of the crash for those who had heard it, and witnessed the aftermath at the scene. In addition to building the temporary pile bridge, General Manager Meade also started the process of rebuilding the original trestle bridge. This involved replacing the original abutments and piers, the wooden support structure, and the bridge sections. A stonemason from Duluth was awarded the contract to build the five piers and abutments. The stone to be used would be from Fond du Lac, Minnesota, which was near Duluth. Unfortunately, the Northern Pacific found the Fond du Lac stone to be shelly and unsubstantial. Therefore, the company decided to use stone from Hinckley, Minnesota, which was located between Duluth and St. Paul. However, once again, this stone did not meet the standards required and was abandoned. The citizens in these towns took great pride in their local products and did not enjoy the negative press these rejections brought. The Duluth newspaper said the railroad company was mining the stone at the wrong time of year claiming the frost had cracked the Fond du Lac stone. They noted that the Hinckley stone was likely rejected for the same reason. The editor still believed that the Fond du Lac stone was best and should be reconsidered for the project. However, the Northern Pacific officials had already decided to use granite from Sauk Rapids, Minnesota. There were numerous quarries in the Sauk Rapids and St. Cloud areas that produced good bridgestone. The big drawback to using Sock Rapids granite was that it would cost an extra $5,000 to ship it to Brainerd. Even though Sock Rapids was actually the closest of the three towns, the rail segment from Sock Rapids to Brainerd had not been completed yet. Therefore, the granite had to be shipped to the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, then up to the Northern Pacific Junction near Duluth, then finally toward Brainerd. Wood for the bridge came from a variety of sources and was composed of several different types. Monster Norway pines from 20 to 60 feet in length were turned into some of the larger bridge pieces. Some of the wood was cut near Aitken, not far from Brainerd. This wood was heavy oak timber. Munger and Gray from Duluth, Minnesota also cut timber for the superstructure of the new bridge. Munger and Gray had a lumber mill at Aniota, which was just southwest of Duluth. 
In Brainerd itself, the Bly Mill was engaged in cutting timber for the new bridge. The Bly Sawmill was located on Boom Lake, on the southwest edge of town. The red line shows the Northern Pacific track through Brainerd. The railroad had a spur track to the Bly Mill, so the large pieces could easily be transported to the shop's location and the bridge site itself. The American Bridge Company of Chicago was hired to construct the bridge components. The bridge crew arrived in Brainerd in February and worked to complete the structure before the ice on the Mississippi River melted in the spring. The original Brainerd Railroad Bridge was all wood. Wood was used because it was cheap and readily available. As mentioned before, how truss bridges were the most common bridges of the time. In 1876, bridges were starting to transition to a wood and steel combination. However, steel was more expensive and was generally harder to come by. The use of steel in bridges allowed for longer spans, which worked well for bridges across rivers. The combination of stone and steel made for strong support structures. Again, this was the original 1871 bridge. And this was its replacement, which was completed in 1876. The actual completion date for the replacement bridge was March 31, 1876. The last rail was laid at about 6 p.m. that Friday. The new bridge featured three large truss segments, each 143 feet long. A single locomotive, operated by Thomas J. Delamere, stopped at the center of each span, testing the strength of each segment. They even allowed a few brave townspeople to ride along on the first engine, which would be unheard of today. After this was done, a second engine was added, stopping at the center of each segment again. This was followed by a test with three engines and a tool car, a total weight of 140 tons. Each time the bridge held up admirably. The new bridge did look different. In 1884, a dam on the Mississippi River was allowed at St. Cloud. Two years later, a second dam was allowed to be built at Brainerd. These dams meant that steamboat traffic was no longer a priority on the river between these two points. The 1871 Brainerd Bridge had a lofted section in the middle, which allowed steamboats to pass underneath. The 1876 bridge no longer required the lofting in the center. This is a closer look at the 1876 bridge, where again you can see how the main wooden vertical support beams lean toward the center. If you look at the replacement bridge even closer, you will notice that the opposing beams were replaced by steel arms on either side, or the blue lines on this image. Despite using steel components, the bridge kept the basic how truss design. However, the new design was actually called a post-patent combination truss bridge. This is another view of the new bridge, looking to the southwest from the east side of the Mississippi. This view is from the east side of the river looking to the north. Finally, this sketch is from the east side of the river, also looking to the southwest. Here's a little history on the major players who were involved in the construction of the new bridge. The first was Charles W. Meade, the general manager of the Northern Pacific Railroad, who was based in St. Paul. Meade arrived at the scene of the 1875 bridge collapse and helped lead its reconstruction. Meade worked on several railroads in the United States, then closed out his career working on a railroad in Guatemala. Samuel J. Wallace also played a key effort in the reconstruction. Wallace was the master of bridges for the Northern Pacific, and had worked for three different railroads as a bridge superintendent. He eventually retired to Northfield, Minnesota, before passing away in 1904. Moses C. Kimberly was the resident engineer for the Northern Pacific Railroad at Brainerd in 1876. 
He worked as a civil engineer at a variety of railroads, then settled in with the Northern Pacific, working his way up the management ladder. Kimberly died in St. Paul in 1923. Finally, Charles G. Franklin from Duluth, Minnesota, was an assistant civil engineer on the 1876 bridge. Franklin did most of his work in Duluth, but spent some time assisting with the Brainerd Bridge reconstruction. Franklin died in Duluth in 1903. The new 1876 Northern Pacific Bridge in Brainerd kept traffic flowing along the Northern Transcontinental Railroad for a number of years. This is how the bridge location appeared during the summer of 2023. That concludes the video. Make sure to check out my other YouTube videos and my primary website at mnbricks.com.